Wow, it's great to see you. Welcome to Mount Zion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's great to see so many smiling faces. Just a few notices for you. Please remember the Church is Together prayer meeting this evening at 6 o'clock. Some people may have had it at 7 o'clock. It's actually 6 o'clock. So if you could be there at New Life, uh, this time uh, it's at, at their place. So uh, we're not sure about the parking, whether it's free at that time of night. So you're going to have to check the board. Uh, and then remember, our own prayer meeting will be held tomorrow evening here at the church at 7 o'clock. It would be great to see more faces. It says, where two or three are gathered, the Lord is in the midst. But it would be nice to have more than two or three. So uh, if you're able to come, that would be wonderful. Uh, next week, we have Community Church in Sarnai uh, at 3 p.m. And Jan and I will be giving a presentation on our recent visit to the Tea Carrier Children's Home in Uganda. Uh, the children are invited to go out to Children's Church during the singing of the third song. But please remember to collect them afterwards. We have a cupboard full of them. Um, a free will offering will be taken up during the singing of the first song of our song set. So please be ready for that. And then Stan will be leading us in communion uh, following the time of praise and worship. And I'd like to have a call to worship. It's Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Come into his presence with singing. And that's what we're going to do now. Chris. Good morning, everyone. Please stand. And all our songs this morning have a common theme, which is the importance and the joy of sharing our faith with other people and seeing others come to a spiritual life. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice. Tender to me the promise of his word in God my Saviour shall my heart rejoice. Tell out my soul the greatness of his name. Make known his might, the deeds his arm has done. Tell his mercy sure from age to age the same his holy name the Lord the mighty one tell out my soul the greatness of his might powers and dominions lay their glory Proud hearts and stubborn wills are put to flight. The hungry fed, the humble lifted high. Tell out my soul the glories of his word. So the greatness of the Lord to 
children's children and forevermore. Shall we pray? Lord, as we come before you now as a gathering of your people here in Mount Zion, we remember your power and greatness as we've just been singing. The greatness of your name, the greatness of your might, and the glories of your word. Your promises are firm and sure, and your mercies are new every morning. What an amazing truth. Yes, Lord, we're rejoicing this morning, not in ourselves, but in you and in your greatness. We thank you and praise you for the blessings of last Sunday and what an amazing celebration we had of your resurrection and the friends who demonstrated their faith and transformation by being baptised. Please keep your mighty hand upon them. And may they know your presence and strength in the coming days. We bring before you the loved ones in our fellowship who are suffering and in pain and sickness. You know all about them and their conditions. And we lift them up to you and pray for your healing hand to be upon them. Lord, we pray for the joint churches together prayer meeting tonight at New Life. Please, Lord, bless that meeting with your presence. Guide us in unity as we seek to lift your name on high in this area and to reach out to the lost and needy. May this Sabbath day bring rest to our hearts and our homes. May God's word feed us today and his spirit lead us into the week and the life to come. Amen. Amen. Please stand for our next song in which an offering will be taken. Yeah? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, There'll be an offering taken in our next song, our opportunity to worship God by giving. If you're visiting us or this if this is your first time, please don't feel free. Please feel free to, to, to not. <laughs> please don't give anything. <laughs> it's fine. We're just happy to have you. I'm all over the place. This well, there we go. Uh, please stand for for our next song. One, two, three.
thank you for being the great God who provides everything that we need. And we pray that the money collected today would go to the forward movement of your gospel in this beautiful town of Cardigan. Amen. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. So it's a dead simple African worship song, which I thought might be really fun and really enjoyable. Um, I translated it from Malawi to English. Well, someone did anyway. <laughs> so uh, you'll pick it up very quickly and very easily as we go along. It's called There's No One, There's No One Like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus.
Um, are you coming up? Yeah. Um, Stan and I have been asked to uh, share communion this morning, which, in light of the party that's currently going on, um, was a wonderful thing that was, well, thing, you know, ceremony that we have actually is part of a feast and a banquet because we're feasting on Jesus and we're feasting on him. So just for this month, we have got a special bread, which I want to talk to you and I've, um, I promised Anth that I'm going to be two minutes, so I'm going to dilute this so quickly. This is Jewish matzah bread. And it's um, a Passover bread. And in a couple of weeks' time, the Jewish people will be celebrating Passover. And as most of us may well be aware, Jesus is our Passover lamb. And normally at their Passover meal, they would use this bread. And it has no yeast in it because it's symbolic of um, sin. So they don't want sin. And they would search the whole of their house to make sure there's no yeast in it. They'd use their whole family which reminded me, should I not search my own house and make sure that I have no sin within me? And they will eat yeast-free breads for seven days. If, you, if I hold it up really clearly, you'll see that it's stripes. Now, this is what the Jewish people produce, and I pray for them to get the revelation. But it's striped bread. You'll see it's striped. And if you look really carefully, it has um, holes in it, which is, means it was pierced. You know, um, Psalms 22 says, they pierced his hands and his feet. Hundreds of years before Jesus went to the cross, physically, that was written. And we all know that that's what happened. Isaiah 53 says that by his stripes we are healed. That when we take this bread, this is Jesus and we believe it brings healing and freedom. Because Passover was the celebration for the Israel community to get from a place of slavery to get to a place of freedom with the Red Sea. And Jesus gives us communion to remind us of the it is finished work that we have been delivered from sin into the glorious sun of his light. What is really special, and I didn't have a linen cloth, so you, I know, don't get religious on me, Kathy, but um, this is going to be my linen cloth. But as part of the Passover family celebrations that they would have in a Jewish house, the father would take, they would wrap three of these together because it represents the fathers, but for me, it represents the Trinity. But I'm not going to go into too much detail. But he would put it into two and he would take the smaller half and he would wrap it into a cloth. And it had a special name, but because I can't pronounce it, I'm not going to, but it does have a special name. And as part of the meal, they would, the father would hide this. It says the father would bury this. It's the piece of bread in a linen cloth that gets buried by the father and the children are asked to seek and find. There's way more. So as this bread goes round, we changed the bread this month for that reason. Stan's going to lead us in communion. And of course, there will be gluten-free, obvious option in the basket. So I just thought I'd share that with you. as we are coming to a time to share the Lord's Supper together. I think it's good for us to prepare our hearts and minds to receive this bread and wine. And we remind ourselves of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11. So, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment 
upon yourself. And in 1 John 1 it says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to give our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So we keep a moment's silence in our hearts. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Lord Jesus, we truly and earnestly admit of our sins. We repent of our sins. So we ask that with the Lord's help, with the Holy Spirit's help, we will lead a life worthy of our calling as Christians and we will endeavor to lead a new life following his commandments of our God and Father and walking from now on in his holy ways. Amen. As Sue referred to it, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. In Luke's Gospel, in chapter 22, Luke reminds us that Jesus said the following to his disciples at a Passover supper before his betrayal, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the cup after they had eaten. <coughs> I'm saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I invite all who know and love Jesus to come to his table and receive the bread and the wine that is to us the body and blood of our Lord and Saviour. And if those who are assisting can come forward, please.
can you please wait once the distribution has been completed and we'll take the bread and the wine together. Lord, we thank you for these things. The body of Christ given for you, we take together the bread. We take together the blood of Christ shed for you. Grant, we pray, almighty God, that the words which we have heard today may through your grace be grafted onto our hearts, that they may bring about in us the fruit of good living to the honour and praise of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So uh, if there's children, uh, now's the time for them to go out. Um, can I invite the rest of you to stand up and just to turn around and uh, greet your fellow worshippers this morning. Take just a moment. Thank you. 
see this in an hour and a half. Okay. How does the Lord grow his church? And what's our part in that? At the end of Acts chapter 2, Luke, the author of Acts, says that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. How did that happen? Well, in our passage this morning, uh, the very next passage in Acts, Luke is going to give us an example of how this adding of people took place. Hundreds and hundreds of people were joining the church at this time. Uh, We know this because at the end of Acts chapter 2, we're told that there's 3,000 on top of the 120 believers they'd been. But at the beginning of Acts chapter 4, we're told that there are around 5,000 men who believed, let alone all the women and children. So Luke has well over 2,000 conversion stories that he can choose from, from this period. But he chooses just one. One that exemplifies all that he wants us to know about how God adds people to the church. In other words, Luke considers this story very important indeed. This is the prime example of how the Lord adds people to his church. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, we're going to uh, read together Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. It'll be on the screen as well, or if you have a Bible app. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this morning you would help us to enter into this passage, perhaps as we never have before, and that you would speak and we would hear your voice, challenging us, comforting us, encouraging us, and that we would be conformed to the image of your Son. Amen. So of those 2,000 plus conversion stories, why is it that this is the one that Luke chooses to tell us? Well, immediately before this account, he told us that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and miraculous signs done by the apostles. Here's an example. Also, immediately before this account, he told us, Every day the believers met together in the temple courts. Here's an example. And immediately before this account, he told us that the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And again, this is an example of all of these things, or at least it would be, because all of these things are included in this account, except for the breaking of bread. We don't get that far because Peter is arrested before that happens. And the point that I'm getting at is that with this short story of the healing of this lame man, Luke is giving us an example of almost everything that he's told us so far the church is supposed to be about. 
For Luke, this story represents something of the ideal of what the church's encounter with those in the world outside should be like. How does the Lord grow his church? And what is our part in this? Well, we're going to walk through this account and try and see why Luke thinks this story is so important uh, for us to know. So, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Isn't it interesting that the disciples continue to meet in the temple? Remember, Jesus had told them that he was the new temple. For those who follow him, he replaces the temple. They don't need the temple sacrifices, the temple worship anymore. Jesus is now the meeting place between God and man, no longer this building. And yet, it's the place that they know. They have to have somewhere to meet, and this is what's familiar to them, even if it's just one possible place to meet, rather than a place that's essential to their faith anymore. But perhaps it's also the only place in Jerusalem large enough for this growing, growing, growing crowd of thousands to meet. But it's striking that Luke tells us at the end of Acts chapter 2 that they also met daily in one another's homes. That they grew in their faith as much or more in homes as they did when they gathered in the temple. Let's not miss the New Testament's call to gather together regularly to grow as disciples, both as a whole church and in smaller groups in one another's homes. That's the dual pattern that we see repeated all the way through Acts and the rest of the New Testament. It's not one or the other, it's both, gathering from worship and meeting in homes. And God adds new people to the church more often as we invite them into our homes and as we visit them in theirs. They meet at the second tamid, that is the second of the twice daily sacrifices in the temple. There's a sacrifice in the morning at dawn, and then there's another in the afternoon at 3 p.m., the ninth hour, which is exactly the time that Jesus died and the time that the temple curtain was torn in two. Now, the Christians are not participating in the sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice was final and complete. But at the time of this second daily sacrifice, there's more of a prayer-oriented gathering in the temple. And that's what they're coming to. They come together to pray. And unless we are people who come together to pray, we won't see the Lord adding to our number those who are being saved. The Jerusalem church was a community of prayer. And this evening's opportunity for the churches to gather together to pray uh, for this town and for the surrounding area is really significant in that regard. So let me encourage you to to come if you're able, 6 p.m. at uh, New Life this month. And then it will be here next month. Uh, Moving on to verse 2. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. The next chapter tells us that this man was uh, over the age of 40, which means that he had been begging there for at least 30 years, probably more. And that means that the apostles are sure to have seen him here many times before. Uh, Just a little bit later, other people uh, who are temple regulars recognize him and they're familiar with him. And of course, this is very likely true of Jesus too. He must also have passed this man on his way into the temple. The man would have been placed here by his family so that he could earn his keep. And this, of course, was a very good location for begging. The man's physical weakness would have been seen as indicating his moral weakness particularly because he'd had this affliction from birth, not as a result of an accident in later life. In popular belief, being crippled from birth meant that he must be a person who was marked by deep sinfulness in his character. So acts of charity to somebody like this were thought of being of particularly significant spiritual value. Almsgiving was considered an act of righteousness by the Jews, So they're especially likely to do this when they're going up to worship. And so here he was placed at the beautiful gate, an entrance for those going to worship. 
It was a really good place to solicit contributions. Uh, incidentally, because he's considered unclean, uh, that's why he's outside of the temple at the temple gate. He's forbidden from going into the temple itself. When he's healed and he goes into the temple, he's never been in it before, even though he sat outside of it for perhaps 30 years. It puts me in mind of the many people who have passed by this building with all kinds of burdens, some of them for 30 years or more, never been inside. I wonder if they need to be met outside before they'll ever think of coming in. But here he is in this perfect place to ask for alms. So verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. The man sees his need as being met by money. And often the church chooses to respond directly to the expressed needs of those we encounter. This man's asking for money, so that's what we should give him. But the truth is that money is simply going to perpetuate his life as a crippled beggar. Perhaps if we take a step back from the immediate request, we'll see other deeper needs. Surely what this man needs is working limbs. But even then, physical healing is only a partial solution for him. It might leave him able-bodied, but without work, without income, without purpose, without restoration to dignity or a place in his community, without addressing the way that he's thought of by others, or even the way that he thinks of himself or what he believes God thinks of him, having been told all his life that his condition shows that he's a, a deeply sinful person. See, people think about their needs in a certain way, but when we look at them through the eyes of Jesus, we may well find it more appropriate to respond in a different way. We don't always need to respond to the world the ways that we're asked to respond. We can't expect people who are alienated from God to accurately diagnose their own need. So while we should always treat people's view with respect, we cannot simply do what they ask for them. If we're going to see the kingdom of God, the, the reign of God come in their lives, we've been given the secret of the kingdom of God, Jesus says, as yet they have not. And this is why the first thing that Peter and John do might seem a little bit odd. In verse 4, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. Howard Marshall, the New Testament commentator, says, what could have been simply the occasion of mechanical charity is turned into a personal encounter as the lame man and the apostles look intently at one another. I did have a slide that I was thinking of using this morning instead of the, the outstretched hand uh, of, uh, from a uh, movie of Jesus' life or the Acts of the Apostles or whatever it was with um, Peter and John and the beggar staring intently at each other. But actually, if I'd had that up there for 20 minutes as I spoke, it, it's a bit overwhelming, this, this intent glare at one another. So what on earth was going on here? Well, when we engage in charity, we can maintain a distance. We don't have to enter into relationship. Even something like uh, serving food in a homeless shelter can be a, an anonymous activity where perhaps we get to know something of the people that we're serving, but they never get to know us. And Peter here doesn't just give the man his attention. He asks for the man's attention in return. And we aren't going to lead anyone to faith unless we get their attention. That means we have to get out of giving the gospel as a charitable act. Sharing Jesus with someone is a radical act. It interrupts their lives and it requires their attention. So Peter actually commands the man, look at us. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will know the evangelist J. John. I think he's originally from Cyprus. He's called J. John because his Greek name translates as John, son of John. So he goes by J. John. And J. John tells the story of his conversion. Uh, he was at college in London. 
And one day he met a guy in the hall called Andy Economides. And Andy was handing out copies of the Gospel of John. Um, gave one to J. John. And he said, if you can't be bothered to read it, I can't be bothered to talk to you. And J. John says, that got my attention. And he went away and he read the Gospel of John and he came back, found Andy the next day and said, I want to become a Christian. Now, I, I know that most of us are not going to be quite as direct as that. But in the generation in which we're living that is saturated with unimportant messages, texts and tweets and emails and posts, uninformed and unsolicited opinion, endless advertising, in that context, we need to develop the habit of asking for people's attention. Not so that they'll give attention to us, but ultimately so that they'll give attention to Jesus. And people are walking through this world, walking through their lives, looking for answers to all of the problems that they see around them, looking for hope, and entirely unaware that God has spoken hope in Jesus. God has answered their deepest cries for hope and meaning and forgiveness and peace. And we have the joy of announcing that good news to them. If only we can get their attention. Look at us. Give me your attention. In verse 5, so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. There are no preliminaries here. No, can I pray for you? Just, in the name of Jesus, walk. It's a command, it's not even a prayer. Peter's words are in a very deliberate order, and the English does actually reflect the Greek word order. Silver or gold I do not have is first. He disappoints the man. Then he offers him something better than he expected. And that's the way to give the gospel. We have to begin by disappointing people because they already have a certain expectation, a, a hope for what will help them in their lives. In this case, money. But Jesus has so much more in store for them, doesn't he? And we cannot offer them that until other solutions are off the table. And people cannot receive God's wonderful answers in their lives until they stop pursuing their own solutions and start pursuing him. Howard Marshall says it's to be noted that Peter did have access to silver and gold. Remember the last passage about the um, believers all sharing with one another so that there were no needy persons. The point is that in this case, he could offer something better that went to the root of the man's problem. It's important to say that this is not a prohibition on giving financial help. Sometimes money is the appropriate response. The Bible doesn't pit uh, spiritual help against other kinds of help that we can give, material help or physical help. See, physical healing is given to this man in this account, right? But that physical healing is a sign of the salvation of the whole person. The total healing of the whole person that Jesus will give to all who put their faith in him when the kingdom comes in all its fullness. And Marshall says this is a pointer to the church's priorities. We're to demonstrate the love of Christ as a sign of his coming kingdom. And when it is such a sign, we can act really boldly. The apostles don't wait to be asked for healing. They take the initiative. Peter doesn't beg the Lord for healing. There's no magic formula here. The key thing is the acknowledgement that Jesus is at work. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. In other words, by the power and authority of Jesus, walk. But I also want us to recognize that Peter's invitation to the lame man is something more than we might first think. Again, Peter's words are intentional. They're precise. He doesn't simply say, be healed in Jesus' name, which he could certainly have done. He says, walk in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
And this is the invitation, actually, that we have all received to walk in the name of Jesus, to live life in the name of Jesus. It is purpose, vocation, meaning. It is a new relationship with the Lord. The healing of the man's feet and ankles, it's only the start of the walk to which Christ calls this man. It's the instant that will be followed by a lifetime of walking with Jesus. And Peter doesn't wait to see if he's been healed. He lifts the man up. He, he exercises faith in the man's healing here. And surely this is such a lesson to us. When we set out as a church or as individual Christians to serve others, we must all, always do so in faith. We shouldn't do anything where there isn't any room for faith, where we don't leave God any space to act. If we only attempt to do what we can already do in our own strength, where is there room for the Lord to work? You know, we are disappointed because we, we don't really see God do uh, things. But we haven't left him any room to do so. We've organized him out. It's no wonder we rarely see him move in power. We've everything nicely planned out, and all we do is ask for him to bless our plans, you know, the cherry on top of a cake that we've already made entirely ourselves. When we act, we need to act in confidence that God is at work, to put our reputations at risk, to show that we truly have faith in the living God. We're to be an example of what faith in Jesus looks like. We're not supposed to expect all the faith to come from the person in need. Now, how did Peter know to do this? How did he know he should act in this way? Not wait for the healing to take place, but to take this man by the hand and, and to help him up. How did Peter know how to do this? Well, he knew because it was something that he'd seen Jesus do. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, says... A man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and, and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and he said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. You see, Peter here, he's not guessing what to do. He's following the example of Jesus. It's Jesus who is at work here, not Peter. That's not to say that, Jesus, that Peter has no part, you understand. But when the church does its part, Jesus works. You're going to hear me say this again and again and again. We are invited to join what God is doing in the world. It's not our place to ask God to join us in what we're doing. And the believers devoted themselves to the church and the Lord added to their number those being saved. Now, it's worth saying that even in the book of Acts, miracles like this are, are only uh, few and far between. Remember, Acts covers a period of about 30 years. Generally, in the history of the church, healing miracles of this sort, they don't come thick and fast. Sometimes, but not generally. And we can easily see why when we look at some of the folks who call themselves healers in the church today. And David Peterson, commenting on this passage, says, Christians today cannot simply command healing in the name of Jesus. See, healing miracles are not for ours to dole out like candy. And Peter himself says in the speech that follows and explains this healing to the crowd that God will not restore everything until Jesus returns. It's only then that everyone will be healed. Until then, though, it's never wrong to pray for healing. But God in his sovereignty appoints certain healings as signs of his kingdom. Now, don't let any of this discourage you from praying for healing. I'm happy to pray for anyone, anytime, 
And like Peter and John, we need to be listening to the Spirit for the moments when he points to someone in need. But remember, we said that this is Luke's example. Many other stories of people being saved and added to the church, they weren't miraculous healing stories. But everyone who is saved is healed from their sin miraculously. That's why this is such a good example. It's a physical illustration, a visible illustration of what happens spiritually to everyone who is saved. None of us can walk with Jesus until we've been healed by him. Verse 8. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. The word, the word that Luke uses here for jumping is the same unusual verb for jumping that's used in the, the Greek version of Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Then the, the lame will leap like a deer. Most Bible commentators agree that Luke deliberately points us back to this chapter, Isaiah 35, that's a picture of what life will be like when the kingdom of God comes in all its fullness. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The redeemed will walk there and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The man's healing is a, a sign of God's kingdom breaking into the world and it is a foretaste of what that kingdom is going to be like. And healing is a wonderful example but it's not the only sign of God's intention towards people. Freedom for those unjustly imprisoned, release for the oppressed, Love for the unloved, joy for the brokenhearted. Isaiah 35 says, strength for fearful hearts. There are a hundred ways that we can respond to the deep needs of people uh, in the world around us. A hundred ways that will be for them a, a sign and a foretaste of what it'll be like when Jesus' reign comes completely. And the man who was lame he recognizes that this is what's happening because he praises God. He doesn't praise Peter. One commentator says since he had never expected anything like this to happen, and since he realizes as a Jew that this is a powerful miracle that only God the creator could have caused, he gives praise to God. And he's not the only one. Verse 9, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. At the end of the account, the sad thing is that the crowd doesn't join in the praise of God. The words that Luke uses for their response are wonder, amazement, astonishment. Good words, but they're not faith or praise or worship. And that's the sad truth about miracles that Jesus pointed out. He said that even if they saw a man rise from the dead, people wouldn't believe. People are excited by the supernatural, but they're only convicted, they're only changed if they recognize that miracle as a sign and a foretaste of the kingdom of God. If they recognize that the miracle points to all that God in his love intends for them. And signs and foretastes of the kingdom can come in many ways. Whenever we nurture faith in Jesus in another person, Whenever we share something of the hope that we have in Jesus with another person, whenever we share the love of Jesus in word or action or both with another person, if they give us their attention, if through us they give Jesus their attention, then there is every chance that they may glimpse something of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? 
just take a moment and bring to mind a, a neighbor or a friend or a family member who you know is in need of help. What might it look like if the kingdom of God came in all its fullness in this person's life? Is there a way they would like us to respond to them? A way that they would like their need to be met? How should we respond to that? We don't have to respond to people the way they expect us to. What would it look like if God's will was done in this person's life? Let me just give you a moment to bring that person before the Lord. Lord, show us how to respond to the needs of these people we've been thinking about. Show us how to respond to the needs of all of those who you bring us into contact with the rest of this day and over this coming week. Help us to respond to them in ways that will result in praise being given to you. Amen. Please stand for our final song. Yeah.
Have we had a feast? Yes. We certainly have. And a big thank you to the worship team for leading us in that amazing time of worship. Please remember to stay for refreshments, which some will be brought in here, or if you can go out the back and uh, have that. And remember to pick your children up. So we just say the grace. May the, lo- the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.